that you're here with us. I wanna say hi to you if you're here in campus with me at the Surrey campus in Princeton or if you're watching online. If you're watching online, I wanna let you know that we do have some amazing chat hosts. So if you wanna say hi, just drop your name and hello in the chat. If you have any prayer requests, you can drop them there as well or you can send them to Horizon Fam. So this morning, it's kind of rainy outside, but we are having a barbecue here at the Surrey campus right after service. Uh, today, we're going to have Ryan speaking the message, and I have a couple of reminders. We have two summer camps. One is for youth, and one is for the younger kids. Um, we still have a little bit of time to sign up. If you're here in Surrey, you can sign up at the table right behind me. We also are gonna do communion today. So if you're here, you can pick something up from the table on your way in. If you're at home, you can go ahead and get your elements ready. Crackers, juice, bread, whatever you've got, you can get that together and get ready. We just had Canada Day happen, so we're gonna be celebrating that a little bit in service this morning. And we're so happy that you're gonna be able to do that with us today. Like I said, there's gonna be a barbecue directly after service. Since it's raining outside, we're gonna have that inside in the lobby. So gather up your kids, get everything together, and then you can meet us in the lobby. Just a few more minutes before we're gonna start service. So get ready, get those elements ready, and we'll see you for service soon.
Jesus, there's nothing impossible. this morning when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of
Lord send. Lord send revival. Lord send it now. Move of your spirit. Heaven break out. Come now in power. Cover this land like you've done it before. Would you do it again? Lord send revival. Lord send it now. Move of your spirit. Heaven break out. Come now in power. Cover this land like you've done it before. discernment in every decision that needs to be made, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you surround him with people that walk in your light and speak your truth, Lord God. And Lord, I pray for every level of government, Father God, that your presence would rule and reign in that place, Lord God. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness, Father God. And we declare your freedom over our nation, Father God, that you would restore our country to its roots. You'd restore our country to the godly principles. Lord, we need you. We need you in Canada. We need you more than ever, Father God. We ask that you come. You come in your power, Father God, that you'd rule and reign, Father God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. And let's just go back into the song. 
song for a second. to join us as we sing. Welcome to Horizon. My name's Jacob. If you guys want to grab a seat, if you're in the room or watching online. And welcome to those watching in Princeton joining us this morning. It's great to have you with us. Um, happy Canada Day. Canada Day long weekend, everyone. We have a quick video 
uh, on the screens, and then we're going to jump into what's next. Here we go. Hello, everybody. This is Praxis. Um, um, my wife, Jen, and I lead the campus, uh, campus Princeton. Um, and as you know, past November, we had a tremendous, um, what they called atmospheric river, and the town was flooded. Like, it hasn't been like, like 70 years or something. So the water levels reached up to like seven feet. Um, basement was total. Um, and alongside with that, like most of our downtown area, especially this, the Kenley Avenue was uh, affected. We had more than 500 properties affected by this aftermath. Um, so we, uh, we're having, on July 30th, we're gonna be having a serve day where um, Pastor Jen has been working with the town of Princeton, gathering some volunteers, and we're gonna be helping um, many of our neighbors to get some of the work done in advance. It's gonna be a great hands-on day. Um, most, most of it may be working on the yard. There's a lot of, um, still of, of a lot of the debris, a lot of the aftermath, the, the, the effect of the, of the flood. So um, we would like to invite you there's an opportunity for you guys to be uh, hands and feet and help us and help our neighbors in Princeton to, to get back in their feet. So um, follow us and we would love to see you here. We'd love to have you here. Awesome. Um, yes, so our Princeton campus next, no, at the end of the month, July 30th, I believe is the date, we're having a serve day up in Princeton. So. As many of you will be aware, um, Princeton was hit with some devastating floods um, back in November, and the town still continues to recover. I, I, we speak every week to our campus pastors out there, Jen and Praxis, and there are still a lot of properties um, with severe damage, with, um, with like flooded basements, and just debris everywhere. And so end of the month, July 30th, we'll have some more information out by email and social media soon. A big group of us are going up to Horizon Princeton campus to help serve in the town. And so there's um, a whole bunch of manual labor tasks. And if that's not quite your thing, we'll also need childcare for, to help with in the town on that day as well. And so just keep an eye out for some more details. But it's just our way to, to serve in our community. And it would be a great support to our Princeton campus for any of our team and any of our, our congregation here in Surrey to go and join our Princeton campus for that day. It would mean so much to the town up there to see a big crew of us go up, and we're gonna take a bus up. So if transportation is an issue, or you don't wanna pay the price of fuel at the moment, there's an easy way. <laughs> um, cool. Um, so last week was Scholarship Sunday, so I'm just gonna mention that, and then I'll invite um, Ryan to come and share with us today. Um, when I was a teenager, my, I, I didn't come to Horizon, I grew up in the UK, and every summer, I would go to, our church would have a church camp and it was called Soul Survivor. And I'm sure there's many of you guys remember um, fun names from the 90s of church camps. Ours was called Soul Survivor. <laughs> it seems funny now to think back to it, but it was, it was such a powerful time in my life. And I think I went every year from, I don't know, age 13 to, to 18 and my life was impacted at camp. And I would not be half the person I am today if I hadn't had those amazing times at camp each summer of going deeper with Jesus, of spending time with my friends in a, in a Christian environment where we could have those deeper conversations. And for me, there's something special about, about having an extended time away, a, an extended time where your focus is solely on, on Jesus and, and going deeper with him. And I'm so thankful that my church would, would do a camp each year. And I, I know the blessing it's been in my life personally. And so thank you, church, for, for investing into our students and into our kids' ministry. I've had the privilege since being at Horizon on staff of going to each of our kids and youth camps every summer. And they, it's been amazing to watch them, watch them grow in numbers and to watch community kids and youth come along and be impacted by them. And I know many of our, of our youth say they're the highlight of their summer and our, our youth team would say it's the best week of the year. And, and I'd, I'd say, I'd agree. Those, those camps are phenomenal times of encounter with Jesus. There's nothing quite like seeing, seeing a kid speak in tongues for the first time or seeing a kid come from the community who has no Christian background. And by the week, they've made a meaningful relationship with Jesus. It is incredible. So thank you, church, for sowing into that. And so 
It's, it's my excitement to announce that last week on Scholarship Sunday, we raised $7,635 for camps. <laughs> Woo! It's amazing. So thank you, church. With, with that amount of money that's come in, we don't need to turn anyone away who needs a scholarship. And we are so excited to see what God is gonna do this summer. And I'm just, I personally cannot wait for our camps this year. Kids, summer party only starts in two weeks, is only two weeks away. And so if you could be praying for those encounters, for those moments with Jesus, for those, for kids who are coming because they've been invited by a friend, that they would, they would develop a relationship with Jesus for the first time. Yeah, uh, just if you guys could engage and pray with us for that, that would be fantastic. So I'm now gonna invite up uh, Ryan Del Blanc. Ryan is the chaplain here at Regent Christian Academy and is one of our favorite speakers. And so I'm gonna pass it over to him. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. It's so good to be uh, together uh, at Horizon Church, uh, Princeton. It's good to be with you as well uh, through the power of technology. Uh, but it's a joy to be able to look to God's word. One of my favorite things is, uh, is to be able to have the opportunity to study and to look at God's word and then be able to share that with others. So this is a joy for me. And my hope is that the Holy Spirit would speak to you, uh, that it's not about my words, that it's his words that I hope and that we know and we trust is that his word transforms us. Has anyone here ever experienced God's word transform their hearts and experience, transform an experience? And so uh, as a church, we, we love God's word. It guides us, leads us, directs us. And we are starting, uh, we started, kicked off last week with Pastor Terrence into a new series called Foolproof. Someone say Foolproof. Uh, and, and in this series, uh, we are thinking about uh, wisdom literature in Scripture. So we're looking at Proverbs, we're looking at Psalms, uh, potentially Ecclesiastes, Job, or even in the New Testament, the book of James, uh, which we'll reference a little bit today. Uh, but to look to God's Word, to principles, to guide us and lead us. Uh, much like, as you can see in the picture here, there's a road. When you drive on a road, there are the yellow lines, there's guardrails, there's signs in place to keep us safe, to show us which way to go to do things the right way, God's way. And God hasn't been silent to give us his wisdom. He's revealed principles for us to live in our lives. And we can choose to live a life of wisdom that says, I'm going to follow the Lord's way. Or we can choose the way of the fool and say, you know what? There might be a yellow line there, but I'm just going to drive on in. And what do we risk if we do that? The potential of a head-on collision. And so God, through the Proverbs and wisdom literature, has given us amazing principles to guide us. Now, here's the thing when we look at Proverbs, they are guidelines. They're not always guarantees that if you do this, it's always going to be perfect. Look at the book of Job. It'll remind you that's not always how life works. But as we choose to live and apply God's wisdom, the general principle is this, is that we'll live the way that God desires for us. And so today we're going to uh, kick off, uh, today we're looking at a specific proverb uh, that God, asking God to speak to us through it. In some senses, what we're looking at today, we're looking at two ideas. We're looking at pride and humility. And as we kind of look to these concepts, it's something that can transform the way that we live our lives. And as we think about humility, it actually can be something that helps us apply the remainder of this series as we look to God's wisdom and apply it in our lives. So what I'm going to ask you to do, if you have your Bible, I encourage you to bring your Bible to church. Uh, we're going to mainly be looking at two scriptures today. Uh, so the first one, our anchor, what's guiding us today is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. Then to give us a context of how does, this, how does this principle, how does this proverb live out in reality, we're looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 33. So if you had your Bible, I'd encourage you, put, I've got nice little ribbons in my Bible. You could put your finger in there, whatever it is, because we'll be referring back and forth to that Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, uh, and then also in 2 Chronicles 33. And what I want to do is I want to read our proverb first. It's already on the screen. Uh, and this is the ESV. Uh, and so let's take a look at it together. Uh, it says this in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. 
Toward, uh, toward the scorners, he is scornful. This is speaking about God. So towards the scorners, he is scornful. But to the humble, he gives favor. This is an amazing uh, proverb, an amazing truth. The idea of humility and pride, or in other words, scorn, uh, different ways you can describe that reality, is throughout Proverbs, we hear about the, 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 the wisdom of humility, and we hear about the folly of pride. And this, this is so important, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, that twice in the New Testament, two different authors that we're pretty sure weren't influenced by one another, they talk about this exact same text in James and also in 2 Peter. And so we want to read it again from James. Uh, we're going to put it up on the screen. James chapter 4, verse 6. This is kind of a rephrase saying the same thing, uh, but in a way for us to hold it again. So this principle is throughout God's word. And it says, but he gives more grace. We, God is abounding in grace. God is never in lack. He gives more grace. How do we receive this grace? Therefore, it said, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Today, as we think about pride and humility, we want to think about uh, resisting or receiving. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Either we are resisting God or we are receiving what he has for us. I'm excited to dive in. Before we go further, how about we pray? God, we thank you so much for your word and we thank you for your presence. God, I, I pray that as we come to you now, we come with humble hearts. We come with a posture that says, God, we need to hear from your word. We need to hear from you. We come and we submit ourselves to you and ask that you would, in a fresh way, would you apply a word to our hearts, transform our thinking, transform the way we live, that we might walk in your ways. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you, would you remove uh, my words and replace them with yours? God, that you'd come. We want to encounter you in this place. In Jesus' name, somebody said, amen. amen. Uh, this past week, we were doing something called uh, Summer Prime. Anybody here was on Summer Prime? There's a couple of us. We got some quiet hands. I was hoping for a yeah, but I was excited. It's a summer discipleship program uh, with, with students. And we were in mission. And one thing we did is we went on a hike. And it reminded me of a number of years ago when I went on a hike with some of my friends up in Squamish at the Chief. Anybody heard of the Chief before? Yeah, but it's a great hike. And so we, with a bunch of PLBCers, actually, uh, we went on a hike uh, up the Chief, and it was a beautiful Easter long weekend, uh, and it was fun. So we're ready. It's a sunny day, and we're wearing shorts, having a good time. I wish we were wearing shorts today. It's a little too rainy for that. But we make it up the mountain, or as we're making up the mountain, some of our friends, one of our friends, he rolled his ankle. Uh, so some of our friends that were more gracious than I was decided to help him get down the mountain. I had a goal, and I wanted to get to that mountain, so I kept going with the main group, not by myself, but we went together. And so our friends that went down the mountain, they still wanted to go to the top. So they started climbing back up, two of them. And our group made it all the way to the top of the mountain, the third peak, the highest peak you could get to if you've ever been to the chief. And as we were going up, on another peak, we saw our two friends. And we said, okay, guys, let's kind of try to meet so we're all together as we go back down the mountain. And then all of a sudden, we get a phone call from them saying, we're lost. We, we try to find some shortcuts. We went over some little cracks and some cr uh, cliffs and that kind of stuff. And we can't get anywhere. We can't go higher. We can't go lower. We don't know where to go. And so we're like, okay, we'll find you. At this point, the group of us that had made it to the top had already gone down to the bottom. And now we're deciding, we'll find you. We'll just go hike back up. We think we know where you are. So we decided to hike back up the mountain to find our friends. They call us again. They're a little panicked. And they're like, we think we might call search and rescue. And we're like, no, don't worry. 
We can find you. We, we, I was with my twin brother. We, we can make this happen. We're Scandinavian, good Swedes. We were good on mountains and forests. No problem. Although we grew up in Surrey. Um, <laughs> but so we're like, we'll get you. And so we're like, don't call because it's going to be too expensive if we call for search and rescue. I think they charge you. And so we're climbing up and my brother and I start noticing we're a pair uh, looking for them again. All of a sudden, a helicopter starts circling the mountain. And our friends had finally done the wise thing and they called search and rescue. And so my brother and I, we make it to the top of the mountain. Now, a little more detail. We're wearing shorts, but there's still snow on top of the mountain. And on top of the mountain, it's pretty cold. There's a picture. I wish I would have actually brought it. I'm waist deep in snow, and my twin brother is pulling me out. Um, And all of a sudden, this helicopter that was circling, all of a sudden in front of us, lands on top of the mountain. It was this really surreal moment where this helicopter lands, two guys get out, helicopter takes off, it's search and rescue. They know where our friends are, uh, and they say, hey, can you watch our stuff? And they had like four bags full of clothes, uh, full of uh, heat packs, full of food, all that kind of stuff, things that they would need. And they say, can you watch our stuff? We'll be, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. We'll go get your friends, and then it'll all be good. And so me and my twin brother are like, yeah, we can do that. This is an easy job. Watch your stuff. You guys find our friends, no problem. Well, the 10 minutes go by, 15 minutes go by, 20 minutes go by, 30 minutes go by. And me and my brother are now discovering that the sun is setting. It's getting colder. We're still wearing shorts. And we're wondering, are they coming back? We were getting a little bit nervous. And so we're trying to figure out what are we going to do? Are we going to make our way back down the mountain? It's getting pretty dark. Will we even be able to see? Oh, yeah, we're still wearing shorts and we are now starting to freeze. But we are two strong Swedes that are too proud to. There, there are bags full of clothes, but we're like, no, no, no. We're okay. So now it's again 35 minutes and we're freezing. We decide, you know, okay, maybe we'll just get a little something to help ourselves. So me and my twin brother grab one fleece sweater from the bag, then go knee to knee and wrap our legs with just one because we don't want to take too much. That would be putting people out. And so we sit there shivering on a mountain, covering our knees. And 45, I think about 50 minutes later, our friends with the search and rescue come back and the search and rescue guys say, why aren't you wearing clothes? They're like, there's bags full of clothes and they immediately cover up with the clothes and put heat packs on. But here's the thing. What got in me and my brother's way was our pride. We thought to ourselves, we're fine. We can take care of ourselves. And here's the thing. We resisted what we needed. There was an abundance of stuff, literally clothes from heaven, (laughs) were there for us. And we said, no, we don't want it. But here's the thing. I think this happens in our lives as well, even as believers, where our own pride, our own ability to say, I got it. I can take care of it. What we read from our proverb today is that God opposes the proud. He resists the proud and has grace for the humble. I kind of want to show a picture. So I'm going to invite my friend Joel to come up and what this might look like. This idea of reject or receive. I think maybe if you want to go on this side over here, Joel, our camera guys had no idea that this was coming. So uh, again, when we think about this principle, there's a principle that uh, our pride can actually, when we have pride, not only we're, we're resisting the gifts of God, we're resisting the grace of God. It's like we live with the closed fist, that we say, everything I have, I've got it. I can take care of myself. Now, Joel, let's see your pride fist, this, this closed fist. And here's the thing, God has good things for us, but this is what happens when we have pride. God has good gifts, but you can't catch it because you're holding on to what you think you have. The reality is we we may not have a whole lot, but God wants to give us good gifts, but our pride resists God's moving in our lives. But here's what humility is. Humility looks like an open hand. What's in your hand? Nothing. Humility says, I don't got it on myself. I don't have enough. I don't, I can't, I don't have enough peace, enough wisdom, enough strength. I'm, I'm empty. 
This is what humility shows us. This is the posture of humility. But here's the good news is God gives grace to the humble. We can only receive when we humble ourselves before God. And then guess what happens when our hands are open? We can finally receive all the abundant grace that God has for us. I'm just throwing to see how many he can get. Round of applause for Joel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But what we want to think about today is this simple idea that we can either resist God with, a, with our pride, or we can actually receive from him when we come to him with a posture of humility. So let's keep on moving. What I wanted you to bring a bit of a context to our message is look at the story of an Old Testament king named Manasseh. So again, if you had your finger or your bookmark in 2 Chronicles 33, we want to walk through and look at his life as a way to look at our own lives, to examine the pride in our own hearts, and to see what it would look like if we choose to live a life of humility, a life of wisdom when we choose humility in the sight of God. So it says this uh, in uh, 2 Chronicles 33. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. Imagine having a king who was 12 years old. That doesn't sound like a wise idea, but it happened. And he reigned 50 Five years. That's the longest reign of a king in the Old Testament. It pales in comparison to the eternal reign of King Jesus. Amen. But 55 years as a king in Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he built the high places that his father Hezekiah had broken down. Here we learn, again, there's all these lines of kings and one king out to the other. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, a really great preacher reminded of this habit of kings to kind of turn to the Lord, uh, turn away from the Lord. And, and, and this is this pattern. Uh, 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 Manasseh's father did some great things, some good reforms. And then uh, Manasseh does the opposite. And he erected altars to the Baals. These are false gods of the nations around Israel. And made Ashereth and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. And he built altars to the house of the, in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. He's doing some terrible things building idols to other gods in God's house, in God's temple. And he built altars for the, all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hinnom and used fortune telling and omens and sorceries and dealt with mediums and necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. We can see that there's this idea, and we're going to find out more, that, that Manasseh is living out of his own pride. He wants his things his way. He's attracted by these other religions because they often feed into his own natural desires. And as a result, has done all these things against God, rejecting the ways of the Lord because of his own pride to say, I know how this actually works. Let me show you how it's done. And he does much evil in the sight of the Lord and God gets angry at Manasseh. Angry at Manasseh. It keeps going, getting even worse. It, throughout the, the, the scriptures, whether it's in 2 Chronicles or 1 Kings or Jeremiah, Manasseh is known as a, t a terrible, terrible king, doing things that are unimaginable in, in God's temple in the nation. Uh, verse 7, he carved the, carved the image of the idol he had, ma he had made, he said in the house of God, of which God said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will no more remove the foot of Israel from the land that I appointed for your fathers, if only they will be careful to do all that I have commanded them, as the law and the statutes and the rules given through Moses. Manasseh led Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem astray to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. So again, we get this terrible result of pride is this rejection of God and his ways. And what happens is it gets really bad for God's people. 
That's kind of the story of all these kings. They, they, they turn away from God, things get bad. They eventually turn to God, things get good. As they either choose to humble themselves and follow the Lord, or they choose their own pride and choose to go their own way. So verse 10, God, he's angry, but he reaches out and he says, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they paid no attention. Imagine the pride that God reaches out to you, warning you, trying to say, hey, I'm here, and they reject him. They don't pay attention to God. Here's the principle that we think about is that God opposes the proud. And so let's keep reading. Therefore, the Lord brought upon them the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who captured Manasseh with hooks and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. So here we have the result of his pride. The, the scripture we're looking at, the proverb today is that God opposes the proud. God resists actively the proud. We can see the first, that, that pride resists God. Pride says, I want to do it my way. This is the same sentiment all the way back in the garden. Adam and Eve trying to decide in their pride, we want to say what's right or what's wrong. We'll be the one in charge here. That's resisting God. Pride resists God and in a sense tries to make ourselves God. As a result, pride starts restricting us. Manasseh ends up bound in chains, completely humiliated in another nation. But it binds and restricts us. Pride restricts us in many ways. We already saw with Joel, when we are prideful, it restricts us from receiving the grace of God, restricts us receiving the good gifts that God would have for us. It eventually act, does the opposite. In our pride, we think we're doing what's best, but pride eventually starts restricting us. But it's not even us resisting God. Pride actually causes God to start to resist us. Imagine that, the omnipotent God of the universe actively resisting you. That's what happens to Manasseh. God sends an army to take him captive. And so again, God opposes the proud. Now, one thing I love about the story here that we're going to get to in a moment is that this, uh, this opposition of God actually leads to an opportunity for God's grace. But as we think about pride, I, sometimes it's interesting for us to think to ourselves, I, I don't have pride. I'm all good. That statement there is pretty generally a good sign that you do have pride. But what might pride sound and look like? There's an author, his name's uh, Evan Jackson, says this, pride promotes self. So I want us to think about our own hearts. Maybe we see pride in ourselves. I'll be honest with you, preparing for this sermon, I, I've got pride. There's things that God's been dealing with me and God wants to deal in all of us. And so I don't come to this message as someone who's a, a hero of humility. No, I struggle with my own pride. And so let's see, as we read what it might look like, what it might, what it might say, what does pride sound like? What does it look like? So pride promotes self. Pride considers what's best for me. Pride has a short fuse. Pride says, I know I'm right. Pride looks down on others. Pride thinks he doesn't want any help. Sometimes proud, uh, pride masquerades as self-reliance. We say, I'm just going to be self-sufficient. Well, sometimes that's actually just pride in us. Pride complains. Pride rebels against authority. Pride rejects counsel. Pride has to have it my way. And pride is quick to speak. That's what pride can look like. That's what it can sound like. But that's what proud looks like. But the thing is that proud, that we have to think about what does pride, pride look at. Pride is mainly focused on looking at ourselves, looking at our own abilities, our own strength, and often way over uh, compensated or way uh, 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 inflated view of ourself, looking at our needs first, looking at things from only from our perspective. We live in a culture that today that celebrates pride, 
that celebrates arrogance, that lifts up those who are boastful, that lifts up those who, I'm strong and I can do this on myself. We see this in individuals. We see this with celebrities. We see this with politicians, that we celebrate those who are full of pride. Not long ago, pride was known as a vice, known as a sin. But in our culture, we actually say, if you want to get things done, you, you need to be full of pride. That goes into the opposite of what God would say because God tells us that God opposes the proud. But we live in a world that tries to celebrate it, but at their own peril. God hasn't changed. His world hasn't changed. And so even as a culture, if we celebrate pride and arrogance, the world might agree, but God disagrees and is actively opposed to it. So we need to deal with our pride. We need to deal uh, with our pride. Because uh, it, it's important. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and discover where we might have pride in our lives and replace it with the opposite spirit, which is humility. If we don't, not only do we deny God, but we, we restrict the life that he desires for us. Again, pride closes our fists to God. God wants to give gracious and generous gifts to us, but when we're full of pride, it restricts us. God is also opposed to pride because not only does it dishonor his name, but pride also hurts us. Pride hurts our families. Pride hurts our cities, our churches, our nations. We can see that in Manasseh's life. It was his pride. But guess who also paid the penalty for it? His son did. The generations did. The nation did. God hates pride because one of the reasons, because it hurts us. But here's some good news is that pride doesn't have to be the end of our story. Pride doesn't have to define us. So we want to continue to look at the story of Manasseh because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So let's keep uh, reading. So again, we know that God's opposed Manasseh, put him in chains, chains, but this has actually created an opportunity for Manasseh to experience the grace of God. We'll start again in verse 11. Therefore the Lord brought, uh, brought upon them the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who captured Manasseh with hooks and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. Verse 12. And when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God, and he humbled. Someone say humbled. Humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Isn't this incredible? This king who for years was prideful, resisted actively, rejected God. In his opposition, experience the resistance, experience being in chains, but cried out to God in humility. And God, who knows our hearts, knew that he was being serious. And what does God do to this sinner that's caused the nation to turn away? The moment he turns in humility to God, God turns towards him and gives him the gift of his grace. Because God gives grace to the humble. Some of us might think, I've sinned too much. God can never save me. Yes, he can. You're no Manasseh. Some might think to ourselves, Manasseh at this point is getting old. It's too late for me. No, it's not. It wasn't late for Manasseh. He turned in humility, recognizing that in himself he needed God. This place of recognizing our lack, that in our hands we have nothing, is an amazing gift our understanding our limitations, understanding our humanity, understanding our lack is actually an amazing opportunity for us to receive all that God has for us. God's mercy is so much deeper than we can fathom. And I think he delights in saving people that the rest of us like to write off. Manasseh's like the Old Testament Saul. No one was going to believe that Saul would do anything for the kingdom. But God's grace is bigger. His mercy is so much deeper. And what, all we need to do to receive that grace is to humbly turn to him. Good thing with Manasseh is his humility just isn't words. 
He then comes back and starts reforming and, and turning things around that he had done. The good thing is, is that God can actually restore things that we lost because of our pride. God, is, his mercy is so great that he can reverse things. In, in this case, maybe not everything, but a lot of the things that Manasseh had done, because of his real repentance, real humility, humility was able to restore. So we want to think about what does humility sound like? What does humility look like? Again, from the author, Evan Jackson, he says, in comparison to pride, pride promotes itself where humility lets God do the promoting. Pride considers what's best for me, but humility concerns, considers what's best for others. Pride has a short fuse, but humility has a long fuse. Pride says, I know I'm right. Humility says, I think I could be wrong. Pride looks down on others. Humility looks out for others. Pride thinks it doesn't want any help. Humility knows he needs lots of help. Perhaps one of the areas that I really struggle with pride in my Scandinavian self-sufficiency is that I believe that I don't need anybody else. I can just take care of it. But the reality is, is that's so far from the truth. In the last number of years, one thing I've discovered is that I have a lot of lack there's a lot of help that I need. And what I've discovered is that when I open up to my friends, open up to even counselors and say, I need help, what happens is God actually moves through others to give good grace, good gifts in my life. But I need to humble myself and realize I can't do it on my own. And then when I turn to God, he often has good grace for us. We can't do it on our own. We need God and we need others. Pride complains, but humility is grateful. Lord, help me. Pride rebels against authority, but humility submits to authority. Pride rejects counsel. Humility seeks counsel. Pride has to have it my way. Humility is willing to yield. Pride is quick to speak, and humility is quick to listen. Again, that's what pride can sound like and look like, but what does pride look at? Or what does humility look at? Humility doesn't look at ourself. If it does, all it realizes is our lack. Humility looks at God. I'm not saying that we should look down on ourselves, beat ourselves down. No, but what I'm saying is that what we should do is look to God. He is our source. He's the one that has everything that we need. We can look at our, our humanity and our lack, which gives us the gift to come to God with humility and then receive his gifts. But one thing one of my friends, Mark, says is this, is that, yes, we can still be humble, but we can also walk with the Godfidence. My confidence isn't in myself, isn't in my abilities, isn't in my smart ideas. No, my confidence comes from God and his faithfulness. So I can be humble, but Godfident at the exact same time because of who God is, it's about who he is. There's this amazing paradox with humility. The more prideful that we are, the less we see it. Have you noticed that really pride pe proud people like, no, I don't have a struggle with pride. But the most humble people can discover pride all over the place and then they bring it to God and he does a good work in their life. Here's the thing is that there is some, some paradox, some upside down nature to pride and humility. It is a great gift that we understand our limitations and our humanity. It says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That God delights perfect, showing his power in our weakness. Therefore I boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so the power of Christ, of Christ may rest upon me. Do you want God's power? Come with humility, recognizing that you don't have it on yourself. I've heard of a pastor that every day he prays, God, would you help embarrass me a little bit today? Because in every day he's reminded, not in a big way, but maybe he would stumble on his words or whatever it might be, trip on a rock, just to realize that I'm just a human. And in that place, we open ourselves to real, the, receive grace from God. James reminds us, and he says, when we try to elevate ourselves, we will be made low. Here's the paradox. When we humble ourselves, God will raise us up. When we choose humility, we walk in God's favor, God's grace. 
So what do we receive when we're humble? Well, first we receive God's grace, as we read in our text today, that God gives grace to the humble. How many want God's, more of God's grace in our lives? How many more of his favor, more of his peace, more of his comfort in our lives? Where does it come from? Not from being strong and doing it myself and picking myself up on my bootstraps. No, it comes from saying, God, I've got nothing and I need you. And then he delights to pour in, to give us his grace, give us his favor in our lives. That's an important thing to do. We can also, when we come humbly to God, he also wants to give us his wisdom. Here's Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. James repeats this idea in James 1.5. I love this verse, one of my favorites. I pray it all the time. If any of you lack, someone say lacks, Wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him or her. The way that we receive God's wisdom is to understand our lack of wisdom. This is an amazing gift that God gives us that we can actually admit, I don't know. Parents, have you ever felt that you're like, I just don't have a clue with your parenting? Perfect, because guess what? Now God can pour in his wisdom. Business owners, you're like, I have no idea to handle this situation with my employee. Guess what? Perfect place to be, because God wants to give you the wisdom when you ask for it. But you've got to come with humility, understanding your lack. Last thing we want to think about as we close, as we're about to enter into communion, is this. When we, re- when we come with humility, we can also receive God's salvation. We can receive God's salvation. It says this in Psalm 1827, for you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. Psalm 149 verse four says, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Do you know that God takes pleasure in you? He delights in you. And then it says this, he adorns the humble with salvation. For us, in, for, in order for us to receive salvation, we must come humbly. It's very much like the song early, I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. For us to say we're sorry, we have to humble ourselves first. But when we come and say we're sorry, maybe we have a problem with a friend, then there can be forgiveness. It's the same with the Lord. We need to humble ourselves and say, God, I'm sorry. I've sinned. But in that place, he then pours in his grace. God delights when we humbly come to him to bring us and give us his salvation. But also is amazing that it's not only that with humility that we receive salvation, that we also have a humble savior. We have a humble savior. As Jesus entered Jerusalem on his journey to the cross, which I love that we have on stage today as we think about communion, the humble cross, Jesus didn't come to sit on a throne. He was born in a wooden manger and died on a wooden cross. We have a humble Savior. And as Jesus was making his way to the cross, he entered into Jerusalem. He he was fulfilling something in Zechariah 9, 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Jesus is our salvation. But then it says this, Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. As Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he rode on a donkey, signifying he's a humble king. Before they had the Last Supper, what did Jesus do? He put on an apron and washed his disciples' feet. We have a humble Savior. And as we look at communion, we can think about two things when it comes to humility. First, we realize that when we come to communion, We need to come humbly because we realize we cannot save ourselves. You can't save yourself by being by being really religious. You can't save yourself by just being nice to everybody. 
You can't save yourself by coming to church every Sunday. You can't save yourself by being really nice. You can't save yourself by having all the knowledge. You can't save yourself by having all the money. None of those things will save you. When we come to communion, we remind ourselves of our complete and utter lack and ability to be able to save ourselves. But what can? The blood of Jesus. We come and realize, then we surrender and say, I can't, but I know his blood can save me. It can cleanse me. It can free me. His broken body gives me life. It's in his death that we find eternal life. As we come to communion, we come again, and our posture should be of humility. I'm trusting wholly in the blood of Jesus. It's his sacrifice. So communion is this humbling moment. But in communion, we also look again to our humble Savior. He is the Passover lamb. He is the perfect sacrifice. And it says this in Philippians 2, verse 5. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. When we humble ourselves and trust completely in the work of Jesus, we then encounter our humble King whose His humility purchased our salvation. That it's through His work that we can be saved saved. We come to him humbly. It's by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. And the foundation of all of that is our humility to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, a picture of humility is as we come on our knees and we say, Jesus, my hands are empty. I've got nothing. You've got salvation and you I come and in your blood, I find the forgiveness of my sins. I found the salvation for my soul. What we want to do now is we want to take communion together. So could I ask if you would stand uh, with me as we take communion together as a way to live out this message of humility. We want to think about Jesus, the one who died on a cross for us. There's no better sermon illustration when it comes to humility than Jesus Christ and his work on a cross. If you're here today, you might think, I've, whew, I'm full of pride. And you might say, I need this Jesus you're talking about. You do need this Jesus that we're talking about as much as I do, as much as all of us in this room, because in him alone is our salvation. What we're going to do is before we take communion, it says, uh, it, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that let a person in verse tw uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 28, let a person examine his or herself, then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We want to just take a moment and allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and to highlight pride in our own lives. And then we want to confess and bring those things to the Lord because here's the good news. Whenever we humbly return to God, God always returns to us. God wants to cleanse you. God wants to forgive you. So we're just going to take a moment and ask Holy Spirit, would you reveal pride in my heart? And then as he highlights it, Let's confess it and release it to him. Let's take a moment and talk with Jesus.
Jesus, would you forgive me of my pride? Would you release me from the chains of believing I could do it all on my own? Would you release me from the perspective of me just viewing myself and my own needs and desires? Jesus, help me to see you and the needs of others. Jesus, forgive me and continually reveal pride in my life and help, help remove it so that I would walk in the grace and favor that you have for me. In Jesus' name. Let's partake in communion. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read uh, from 1 first, first Corinthians 11. We'll drink first, or we'll eat the bread first, and then we'll drink together. So hold it, and we'll drink together. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord, which I, off, I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let me pray for the bread. Jesus, we thank you for your body given for us that was beaten and bruised and hung on the cross. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. And we remind ourselves that by your wounds, by your stripes, we are healed. And so Jesus, as we eat your bread, humbly we come to you. God, we ask you would also pour in your grace into our lives in a fresh way. So Jesus, we thank you for the bread. Let's eat together. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your blood that you shed for us. And Jesus, we now come again in humility, recognizing that it's only through your blood that we find forgiveness of our sins. And so Jesus, we humble ourselves. We lay aside any belief that we could earn your favor or earn your salvation. And we recognize that we can only receive it as we humbly come in faith in you, Jesus. So Jesus, thank you for your blood. There's power in your blood. There's strength in your blood. There's healing in your blood. So Jesus, we drink it today in remembrance of you. Let's drink together. Thank you, Lord. So Jesus, we now stand here again, having humbled ourselves, confessing our pride to you, confessing again that we're relying with everything we have alone on your sacrifice. And so Jesus, we again receive your grace, we receive your mercy, and we receive your favor in a fresh way. God, help us to live lives of humility, knowing that as we do, you wanna pour in and you will pour in your grace and your goodness into our lives. We trust you and in Jesus' name, somebody said, Amen. Grab a seat. The first communion uh, that Jesus had was done in the context of community. They had a meal together. We as a church are now going to have a meal together, and Jacob has some more details for us. stuck out to me that humility brings us closer to God and our pride is pushing us away from him. So it gives us a lot of really great things to think about. 
Thanks for joining us for service. If you have any prayer requests, remember that you can drop an email to horizonfam.ca and you can get those prayer requests answered. Um, drop a line in the chat if you have any questions and we have some awesome chat hosts that can help you with whatever questions that you have. Thanks so much again for joining us. If you are here, we are going to have our barbecue in the lobby. So we'll see you there. <laughs>